The Keyboard Chronicles is proudly supported by Elk Electronic in Australia. Elk Electronic provides high quality service and repair of synthesizers and keyboards and also aims to encourage community interaction and learning through meetups and workshops. Find us on Facebook and Instagram or check out elkelectronic.com.au for more about us. We hope you enjoy this podcast. And welcome to episode 37 of the Keyboard Chronicles, a podcast for keyboard players of the gigging variety. I'm your host, David Holloway, and it's great as always to be here with you. And also a big welcome to my returned and extremely valued co-host, Paul Bindig. How are you, sir? I'm really well, thanks, David. Great to be back. Good. You were missed last time. It's great to have you back. As uh, as I said in the intro last one, for some reason you feel the need to actually survive and, and make a living. So I'm not sure where your priorities are, but we'll live with that. <laughs> Um, so no, great to have you back um, Now this episode we're very excited to speak to Mr Tom Brislin For those unaware, Tom is the keyboard player with Iconic Act Kansas uh, And Tom has been with them as you're here for a number of years now um, And unlike a lot of bands where someone may join later in, in the career of the band Tom is a very intrinsic member and he has some fascinating insights of how that's come about So I think it's safe to say, Paul, this is this has been an interesting, uh, it was a very interesting interview and um, Tom was an absolute genius of a guest. Yeah, he really was and, and he shared some, as you just mentioned, David, some some really great insights into how the, the whole dynamic of his involvement with Kansas works, which, which I'm really confident that uh, our listeners will love. Absolutely. So have a listen and we'll see you on the other side. Tom, thank you. Um, I believe you've already said, you know, the rock and roll part of you hasn't risen out of bed yet, but appreciate you at least getting your physical form out of bed at nine o'clock on a East Coast morning. Oh, it's quite all right. I'm glad to be here. No, lovely having you here. So, um, Tom, let's let's talk about the usual keeping busy. You've um, had a bit of an interesting year, I'm guessing. Um, you know, you, you were about to go out on a huge tour, then COVID-19 hit. What, how's your 2020 and first half of 2021 been for you? Well, it, it was tough for everybody. Uh, we were really in a groove with Kansas. Uh, we had resumed our tour in 2020, and it was going great, and we were about to release our album, The Absence of Presence. And at one point, I got on a plane uh, from Nashville, Tennessee, going to the west coast of the U.S. And before that plane took off, I got the call to get off the plane wow. because, yeah, it was things were being canceled and postponed, and so I managed to get myself and my luggage off that plane before it took off. And um, then we didn't, and we didn't resume that year, you know. But we we stayed in touch, and I was doing interviews for. Uh, the you know the upcoming release of the album and still engaging with with the fan base which you know imagine if this had happened before we had such a robust you know internet right uh so uh that was and with the album coming out that was really uh it it was a great way for us to to yeah to stay connected with, with the kansas fans and it would have been amazing if we were on tour if when it came out but that's that's what happened. So, mm. um, and and I said to myself, well, I, I, we're not playing shows, but I have to keep playing. And so I I just got my keyboard set up and dug out my old you know classical songbooks and um, or you know sheet music things like that and just kind of kept my chops going and and kept writing. That was one of the main important things. I, I made a made a, a, a conscious effort to make sure I just hit record on on the voice memos at least mm-hmm. you know and just started playing free and seeing what happens and and start to get the idea mill going as much as possible uh because that wasn't going to stop um and it, it was tricky you know because you know you, this harrowing 
thing that was going on in the world and you have this like existential (laughs) crisis looming in the distance and you're like yeah well i I, what do i do i play keyboards i write songs i sing let's let's keep doing that wherever you know however i can yeah no great outlook i'm curious tom what does Tom Brislin reached for when he's looking to keep his chops up. You mentioned some some classical music and that sort of thing. What what, what stuff did you did you go to 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 play? I I made a decision that I would keep it all in terms of that I would be playing music all the time as opposed to um, doing a lot of exercises and mm-hmm. things like that because uh, I've done my fair share for sure and I wanted to keep every moment as musical as possible so if i wanted to warm up uh, instead of just doing some hannon or something like that Mm -hmm. which is great uh but i want i did some debussy instead just like some uh, you know like uh, arabesque or something just to get the uh the ball rolling each day and um also kind of reacquaint myself with reading which i you know i hadn't done a lot of over the past few years um so I would do some Debussy and then of course the Mazorsky pictures at an exhibition has been kind of my long-term life <laughs> bucket list <laughs> sure. thing that I've been trying to con- the dragon to slay, you know? And, uh, so I decided to chip away at that, um, uh, Chopin etudes, you know, just, but taking them really slow, you know, my, yeah, yeah. my classical life was you know in, in university <laughs> a long time ago um sure. and uh and getting it back into some jazz stuff too like um learning some kenny Barron uh piano solos just straight from ear right from the recording um keeping that going and and i i got pretty regimented with it too i would do like 10 minute blocks 15 minute blocks of, of each of those things i mean i even have the timer going I have like yeah, a, right. like a like a power hour of sorts, you know, where I'd be like, oh, time for the next thing, and as that way, I, I made sure that I tended to sing, you know, Kansas music, keep that fresh, and like I mentioned, the the writing and and, and getting uh, getting the ideas going. Yeah, fantastic. I, I'm curious if if we take it back to 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 the start, what. Can you share your journey with us as a, as a as a young person, your formative years? What got you into playing music, playing piano, and and how did that then progress to playing in bands, playing out? Well, the piano in the house was the entertainment center, so to speak, uh, when I was a little kid, and I'm the youngest of five, mm-hmm. and banging on the piano appeared to be a great way to get attention. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but more than that, I just, I just loved it. I, I loved the sounds and I love the idea of making up stuff too, you know, just creating, you know, I think I had a list of songs before I could even really play anything Yeah, and a list of originals. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <nice>. <laughs> I found vocabulary at like three to four years old and you know, I don't know. It was like then a couple of years later, uh, my sisters started teaching me how to play. They were my first piano teachers and my brother was in rock bands and just looking up to them. And, and my other sister had a great record collection in, in the house and just me discovering the record player and how fun that was. Yeah, um, it it was it was it for me. I, I just I loved it and and just kept at it and and it just seemed to be where i wanted to be was behind that piano mm-hmm. great and and obviously not just behind the piano but also having a, a hell of a go at singing yourself so tom once you hit those early adult years um is it fair to say you started out with your own outfit i i, I am we were obviously going to talk in great depth about your uh, work with Kansas, your songwriting chops with them and so on, but um, obviously wanting to cover some of that earlier stuff as well. Talk a bit, a, a little bit about you were spiraling, t- turning into spiraling and that, that whole experience for you. When I was at university, I was studying jazz, but also classical. And I was a rocker too, you know, and I was like, well, this is who I am. I love all of these things. And I had a prog rock band in high school called Tachyon. Yes, we, we were very important. But we actually, when I look back on it, it's uh, 
we were onto something, you know, we wanted to make creative rock music. That was really the thing. And it was already out of vogue, you know, by the time we, we got there in the 90s. Um, but when I went off to school, I still wanted to write music. And I had that progressive rock influence. I was getting in depth into the worlds of jazz and classical music. And I started to appreciate singer songwriters more and and a, an R and B Stevie Wonder and it, you know I mean just everything was just sort of um, colliding and I thought that I would just write music that kind of reflected those interests and start and start a recording project which then became a band before I knew it. Mm. Uh, and that was You Were Spiraling, which was named from the, there was a quote from this movie called The Commitments from the 90s oh, yeah. uh, mm-hmm. about the kids in Ireland who form a soul band. And one of the seasoned pros, the trumpet player, you know, yells at the young sax player for playing bebop licks on the gig <laughs> and says, you know, soul has corners, but you were spiraling and that's jazz and that doesn't belong here or something to that effect. I'm paraphrasing. And that i was like yeah that's that's what i want to do i want to make a band where we're playing like the stuff that we're not supposed to play (laughs) and um so the early incarnation of spiraling was all like fellow jazz students uh, and we were all you know between 18 and 22 years old and we just didn't really see the rules there and and also this was like when grunge and alternative rock was really rearing its head in the early 90s so we'd play a gig and I would routinely be the only keyboard player <laughs> uh, within miles of the place. Yeah. That was like the keyboards were kind of, you know, kind of pushed out of the rock bands or, or like pushed to the side of the stage at least, you know. Um, but here I was with my, you know, Insonic VFX and, you know, playing all these, you know, wavetable sounds and like, you know, just doing all this stuff and trying in a rock band context and um, trying to, you know, just do something original. And my and it sort of became the singer by default. We had auditioned a few singers, but I was writing all these lyrics and they were getting more and more personal. So I said, why don't I step it up and get a little bit more um of a concept as a vocalist yeah so that and and we did that for a few years and the band lineup evolved and guys came and went as as they do when we were in college and uh it, in the late 90s we started playing support for bands like they might be yes. giants and uh violent femmes and life as an opening band, as a support act, it, it was like you had to get to the point right away or the crowd would eat you alive. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so the songs became more streamlined. You know, we started to rock a bit more. Um, and it was just because we wanted to thrive and we wanted to get that following. And we weren't just, you know, doing an about face and changing who we were just to please some a uh, random audience, but it just, it was subliminal, you know, it subconsciously, I started writing a bit more uh, uh, direct yeah. rock songs and we shortened the name to spiraling over time. And um, mm-hmm. we never did get a major record deal, but we developed a following enough yeah. to, to release some, some independent albums. And I was getting experience as a producer as well. And, and on top of all of it. And we'll be linking to um, a couple of the great songs from Spiraling in, in our show notes. But um, just look, as a major, they might be Giants fanboy and, and picking up on your comment about uh, how you get, need to get to the point quickly with a support act. See, my guess is I would prefer to open for they might be Giants and the Violent Femmes as far as the, the judgment of the audience. Or am I wrong? It was a different vibe mm. uh, because the Violent Femmes fans, they just came to party, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, but what was interesting is that Violent Femmes would have us up on stage sitting in with them and playing like free oh, wow. form, like Ornette Coleman influenced free jazz. Yeah, <laughs> and, wow. and they, they wanted they really liked to to get experimental because they had their hits. Um, but there they were very um, interesting. You know, they, they wouldn't just uh it wasn't just all stock stuff no, with them. They no. wanted to to experiment, and and Brian Ritchie, the bassist, he had a hat with a theremin in it. 
Well. And so he would be like putting his hand, wearing this hat and like moving his hands to his head. Like <laughs> and you'd hear this theremin going wild through That's through the whole amazing. thing, you know. He, um, yeah. So that was that was very interesting. Now, they might be giants. On the other hand, they had um, such a, a, a varied set. Yes. As you know, <laughs> they, they already had so many albums out and they they went back to their drum machine routes and two piece and then they had this great live band yeah. and there were it was, it was all about the fun but there were there were some antics uh on stage and so their their audience was a bit more open to quirky and yeah. unusual things so you know if we if we took a left turn in our music here and there it wouldn't be lost on on them for sure uh, but both both experiences were, were were really fun for us. Yeah, I mean, never forget it. And so, I mean, that and that is a huge experience on on your own. And going through your bio, uh, Tom, it, it was just amazing. Just the the variety there. I mean, uh, just even talking about meatloaf, and that's sort of roughly in the period between what you were spiraling and then spiraling. Um, how did that come about? I was playing in New Jersey, where I'm from, mm. uh, with a, a singer-songwriter named Glenn Burtnick, who is from New Jersey and had some major success uh, writing songs that went to number one for Don Henley and Patti Smythe and mm. Randy Travis. And he was also a member of Styx in the 90s and the 2000s. And he continued to play in and around New Jersey uh, with very cool, like, Beatles, late Beatles influenced original music. And right at it, when I graduated from university, I, I got in his band and I was still able to do spiraling because he, he you know, he wasn't playing all the time. Uh, but so I was like kind of doing this juggling act and that was kind of par for the course with me back then. I, I would, it was like, I was waiting for the bat phone to ring and I would jump down the pole into the Batmobile, go to whatever gig. <laughs> they say, oh, you want to play at an art gallery? Yes, I will do that. You know, um, you want to play at an Italian restaurant? Sure, I'll play the standards. And um, I, I, I was in that mode where it was like, get out there and play as much as you can. And when Glenn Burton had called, it was a chance to um, recreate great sounds that were done on the albums. Like he mm -hmm. had... Um, just a lot of uh, bi a big sonic palette in his, you know, power pop, intelligent pop music. And I wanted to to get those sounds live, you know, and I didn't have a lot of gear at the time, but I was a sounds geek and, and I just loved synths. And and um, so I took his gig really seriously and we played um, some some really memorable shows. But I think I, I, I made a good impression on him because I was taking care of the sounds as well as the parts. Because yeah. I think a lot of times in the local scene, there are great piano players, there are great organ players, and there are great knob twiddlers. And But the multi-keyboardist was sort of kind of uh, an endangered species That's right. at, this, at this time. And the ones that were around were were locked into club date bands and you know wedding bands or or yeah. were getting snatched up by big tours already so um i going back to that playing with my band in the in the club scene and during the grunge era it was like the the multi keyboardists were were getting harder to find and and so it's a long story but i i, I made a, a good enough impression on glenn that we've continued our our musical relationship to this day right. and and he collaborates with um, a lot of songwriters, including Chasm Sultan, mm. who, who was in Utopia with Todd Rundgren and was Meatloaf's musical director at, at the time in the late 90s. So um, he gave me a recommendation and uh, Meatloaf was looking for a piano player and I, I got the audition with Chasm. Uh, he heard me first. And so I had a little bit of time to get that material together and play a few songs for Chasm. And I made it through to you know the <laughs> the you're in the band with an asterisk you know like until meatloaf is there <laughs> and he gives you the, until he gives you the thumbs up um and uh but i was i was 24 and i was super eager and and um ooh, he meatloaf was very welcoming and, and supportive and right. he knew that you know i hadn't done any world touring prior to that um so i, I was in meatloaf's band for a few years 
And oh, I, can uh, only, I can only imagine that was fun, Tom. Um, that that music is so bombastic, and the piano is so prominent. I imagine it was very enjoyable. It, it was more than I expected it to be. Because, you know, I was at one point I was a little snob, you know, and I was like, oh, meatloaf. Come on, man. It's like, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm in, you know, whatever. And and then I'm playing it. I'm like, oh, yeah, this is a yeah. lot of fun to do. And it was interesting if I could just add that the jazz training helped, mm-hmm. even though there was nothing jazz about the meatloaf music per se. He liked to employ a lot of rubato and dramatic pauses and stopping and starting and you had to be listening to his every move because he could leave you you know he could throw you and and the piano was the linchpin between him and his whimsy (laughs) and the rest of the band so i had to be really on on top of things and well to be frank that's like that's how you play with jazz singers that's right. And and a lot of the people who came up in the rock scene alone were just sort of used to like playing it down how it how it goes. And that flexibility muscle hadn't oh, you know, it doesn't always get to develop. So I was just like, oh, well, here it comes. You know, I mean, all throughout university, it was like listen 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 to your band listen to your singer listen to everybody it was like it was so stressed and it's such a simple thing and yet um i believe one of the most important factors and i i was saying um tom to paul before the show and um you you've got every right to hang up in disgust and our listeners can scream at us after the show but i would argue that meat life is pop prog Mm. (laughs) i don't i don't i don't disagree yeah i'll see you i mean i'll see you in court (laughs) yeah. <laughs> but, uh, no, no. Um, uh, so, um, no, well, let's see. I, I, I agree because it's got there are movements, there are time changes, tempo changes. Um, it's definitely got a bit of that. Um, this is more than just a rock band mm-hmm. vibe. You know, this is we, we can do more with a rock band we have the power to kind of take the listener on this whole escapade through through everything um so you know i, I don't disagree i mean yeah it does does it have like seven eight time and <laughs> you know huge profit five <laughs> chords going on no but but it's um yeah it's it's not like i know it's a cliche i say but it ain't playing money money <laughs> that's right um, you know, it's it's you have to be on your toes to yeah. play this stuff. Yeah, I think it's got similar grandiosity. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, and there's that too. Uh, with meatloaf, it's even a little bit more tongue in cheek. Yes, yeah. and that's what I came to learn, and and got me over my snobbery because Jim Steinman and Meatloaf are kind of giggling in the background through this whole thing. <laughs> uh huh. Uh huh. And they're they're like because. To, to Jim Steinman, making a nine minute song is a subversive move. Yeah. yeah. And that is rock and roll to be subversive, to break the rules, right? So to him, he's like, let's throw in the kitchen sink and then throw in two more kitchen sinks um, <laughs> because that's fun. You know what I mean? That was, that yeah. was, the, and, and I got the idea and, and I realized how much of a sort of a, um, a tongue-in-cheek Springsteen it was, yeah, too. Yep. Because uh, he brought in a few of the E Street band for the album, and, and it has a, a bit of that, like, you know, maybe let's get out of this town, let, you know, let's <laughs> go, you know, that, that teen drama sort of thing. Um, it's, uh, yeah, there's, there's a relation there. But, yeah, the bombast and everything, it mm-hmm. was all part of the, the fun, for sure. Tom, I'm going to take you forward radically in time, but you mentioned something that that triggered this question. So you, you talked about, yeah, you know, the importance of not just playing just piano or just organ, but but being able to cover a variety of parts and roles. And so I'm I'm really fascinated as to what the current Kansas rig looks like. What I wanted to do was pay respect to all those great sounds. Uh-huh. Uh, and one thing that I came across. 20 years ago when I when I did the yes tour was uh, you want those great sounds but you also want some reliability 
on the road. And so I wasn't about to just break out a completely vintage rig for the live thing, especially being new to the band. You don't want to be the one that's, you know, waving the white flag because your equipment went down on stage. Um, so I employed, I was like, let me get some real analog juice in here. So I have a mini Moog Voyager, which funny enough is now a vintage synth. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was thinking, oh, yeah, yeah. Let, me use some, let me use some more modern gear, you know, like the the 15 year old mini Moog Voyager. <laughs> um, but they they were really interested in that. They were like, oh, wow, mini Moog. In fact, Carrie Livgren, uh, the long time, you know, the, the classic, you know, member of Kansas who had long since retired. He came to one of our shows and sat in with the band and was looking at the Voyager and he wasn't as familiar with with what Moog had done with the Voyager. And he was like, this is a mini Moog reimagined. And, and uh, cause he was, he remembered the old school mini Moog, which is just a big part of those Kansas albums. So he, he was very uh, intrigued by that. And the band was from, from the start of that, they, they liked hearing some of that classic flavor come back. So I use that. I have a profit rev to, um, and, on, so that and the Voyager on, are on one stand. And on the other stand, I have a piano controller, which is soon to be replaced by Nord Piano 5. Uh -huh. um, but at the moment, I'm using a Studio Logic controller, and it's controlling Ivory on a MacBook Pro. Oh, yeah. Um, and I also have, that's running in main stage. And so I'm using a lot of software synths for other sounds, like to get the, the old ARP Selena string ensemble sounds. I'm using uh, IK Multimedia Centronic. And because mm -hmm. uh, right. they, uh, they have a lot of um, recreations of, of some of the ARP stuff and some of the poly synths that Kansas was using in the 70s. So that's a big part of it. Um, I also use the audio modeling swam uh, cello oh, yeah. for dust in the wind uh, and i use the touch pad on the voyager as a sort of an expressive controller for that to get the vibrato and the volume swells and stuff nice. and um so they they do great work the audio modeling guys in italy um and <clears throat> so uh, and and you know there there are other since in there cherry audio has been coming out with a lot of new stuff i haven't incorporated it into the rig yet but they're they're doing really cool mm -hmm. and creations um that i've been dabbling with um but and uh so the main stage is sort of the hub and any of the keyboards in the rig can be a controller for that and the fourth keyboard on top of the piano is a hammond xk5 organ which is going through a leslie 122 xb which we have in the wings nice. you know on, back, you know on the side of the stage um they gave me the option to bring a real B3 out, and it was really tempting yes. um, because, oh, man, the, 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 the might and the glory of a real yeah, B3. Of course. I, the more I was working through the set and just thinking of practice, I was like, well, let me, let me split the difference. Let me get the, the Leslie going, mm. uh, get that air, air moving, and get the touch that the Hammond XK5 has that really great multi-contact touch. Uh, on, on the keyboard, like like what a B3 has. So if you're you're playing very lightly, you can get some of that, you know, con con the percussion sort of thing. And um, I really love the feel of it. Um, and that way, I can also layer sounds because their tunes like the Spider mm -hmm. and other Kansas classics, where they they had overdubbed piano and organ doing the same thing. Right. And I was like, well, at least if I have MIDI in in the mix with the organ. I can I can do I can get even closer to uh, capturing as much of the original flavor uh, as possible, and uh, w while still having like some some realness in in the sound. Um, and that's the rig. It's four keyboards and the MacBook Pro, which is going through uh, out, out the audio um, interface for that is a key Largo from Radial which is also a DI. So the yes. computer goes right into that. And, um, but we're, we're gonna change it up a little bit when the Nord comes in. I'll probably be in using its onboard pianos more and more. Um, 
Yeah, I was, oh, about, I I was about to say, do you have redundancy built in there, Tom? It sounds like, because I, I know I'm, even at my weekend warrior level, I'm paranoid about main stage. You have, it sounds like you have some good redundancy built in there. Well, yeah, I mean, in my, I, I would love to have like a complete B rig running in, in, in uh, simultaneously and just have sort of a, a panic A, B switch. Um, and, and that still might come to be at the moment, but when I, if, when I'm running one computer, um, I always want to have, yeah, like something that's not the computer that that's can right. carry on in case, uh, it right now it's the organ, yeah. you know, so I would have to adapt and it's like, you know, while if the computer freezes or crashes or something, I'd ha I would go to Oregon, um, and just, you know, people will get a custom show. Oh, right. remember when you played that part on Oregon? You know, how great, you know, and the, and the Moog and the, and the Rev 2 are, are still alive, but the most of the sounds are coming from yeah. the, the computer. So um, now with the Nord in the mix, the piano will add to that redundancy, and I'll still keep Ivory at the ready yeah. um, in case the Nord goes funny. Um, so um, that's, uh, that's kind of what I want to do. But yeah, the, it... It, it definitely helps to have a plan B mm. uh, when dealing with any technology. And uh, um, but ultimately, as 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 we progress with the band, um, you know, I, I'm going to just keep refining the rig and, and getting it to be as reliable and as good feeling as possible. That's that's really you know, I feel like we've got the sounds locked in the band and that the, the is, is responding very well to the sounds and the audience are I'm getting those comments too. They're like, oh, yeah, I, I remember I haven't heard those kind of sounds in a while. It's like even something simple as a string pad, you know, it's on the record in the in 1978 on a Selena string ensemble. And then, you know, in the 80s, they bring in their you know, Juno 60 or whatever doing it. And then by the 90s, somebody gets a Kurzweil and then they just were like, oh, well, let's use, quote, better strings. And then uh -huh. it's like, uh, you know, string samples. It's good. It's still about the music. That's right. But but over the course of 40 years, things have changed a lot. And I was like, but what if like the way I look at it, I imagine like when you grow up with an album and it changes your life. And I think the sounds are part of that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so like I would do I, I, I want it because that's who's coming to show and if so we're going to play a deep cut from point of no return um, I want to give people that feeling that they had when they were like sitting there with the record player when they were young and their, their imagination was taking them somewhere and because uh, that's why people still come back to concerts of that's bands right. like Kansas so years mm -hmm. later there's there's a uh, you know, I, I want to just pay respect to to all of it. And look, sometimes we can infuse a little bit of newness to the sound. I mean, that's what John Anderson wanted with Yes. He wanted Yes into the 21st century. He wanted to you to make things to update things constantly. And if you look at it, you think about these bands in the 70s, they were using all the latest and greatest stuff, mm. you know. People, you know, trying to recreate the Jimi Hendrix sound by using old gear. But Jimi Hendrix was using the cutting edge of yeah. what he could get his hands on. So with John Anderson and some of these guys from the Prague era, they, they still wanted to to see what was next and, and what could be coming up next. But. I found that there would be a little bit of a juggling act. It's like, yeah, I want to you want to keep the music fresh. But I don't want to alienate any listeners either. Yeah, yeah. So it's um, I just started, you know, as as a starting point. Let let me see if I could get the Kansas stuff to be, um, accurate and and representative of of what it was back in the day. Because you can now. It's with 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 main stage and everything. Right. I mean, it's it's, <laughs> it's uh pretty pretty powerful. Yo, know, speaking of cutting edge, if if we listen to Kansas's new album absence of presence you were really heavily involved with the songwriting there are you able to share with us what what your contribution sort of looked like from a from a songwriting perspective and you know how do you feel as as i guess the new guy in kansas how do you feel their sounds evolved and changed over time in my first conversation with phil ehart when he called me to ask me to join kansas i 
want I asked him if I was welcome into the the songwriting and that aspect of the band as well because I knew that the band was doing new music yeah. and he said absolutely but show us what you have <laughs> you know they want, <laughs> they're like yeah if we dig if we dig it then yes you know <laughs> so um that was refreshing and very inspiring because these other gr- bands that i played with that i adored like yes and um you know playing with camel and renaissance and stuff my role was strictly to recreate parts and yep. to do what was there um, but with Kansas, Phil said, no, we want you to be a member of this band. Um, you're not a, a touring musician. There's no asterisk at the end of your name. Um, this is, you're in Kansas. So yeah, bring it. And so I got to work pretty quickly. Now, they had already had the music for, I would say, six songs uh, approved and ready to be recorded for the most part. Zach mm-hmm. Rizvi, who had been brought into the band a few years earlier as a writer and producer, and and they brought him into the band uh, even beyond that, uh, he had written the music um, for these six songs, but he doesn't write lyrics. And I said, well, maybe my, my best chance of, of getting getting into this whole mm-hmm. thing would be to, yeah. to write some, some lyrics for some music that's already been given the green light. Yeah. And w- the way Zach's demos worked is that he would play the vocal melodies on guitar and just specify, you know, that part is what should be the, the melody. And it was a really interesting concept to write lyrics that, you know, had a concept, but then you you sort of sculpt them to fit the rhythms and yeah. the... And the phrasing it, it was it was a cool it was a cool way to do things and yeah. phil ehart liked to create titles and say here's here's a title <laughs> the absence of presence now here's what i'm thinking about it but you can think about it whatever you want but go for it and that's a good exercise for yeah. a lyricist too like getting the ball the ball rolling man um it, it was uh it, it was it was a it was a cool thing, but I, I gotta be honest, lyrics for me are, are the toughest part because I don't I don't wanna make any bad ones. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. of course. And 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 you know, it's 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 really it's really tough to write stuff that passes muster. And so what I had to just accept was that I had to keep the pen moving on the paper and just don't worry about if it's good yet. Just do the process. Get the muscle working of writing lyrics and just go for it and i would even start writing almost like storyboards like if i said well here's what i want to express in this verse and i'd put a little like almost like a script on the side and it would have no phrasing no rhymes no lyrics and then i say how do i turn that idea into lyrics um so i was experimenting with all these different tools to to write to write them and we'd be on tour and you know in the hotel and you know, I'd be just writing my, mm. writing my lyrics in between gigs because I also had this huge set of Kansas music to master yes. at the, the same time. But I was like, I didn't want to pass up that opportunity to to be a part of the writing because I could have just easily said, well, look, I, I've just got to focus on on getting in this band and getting the show right. But I, I knew I would have kicked myself if the album went oh, by absolutely. and I wasn't able to, to get into it. So they started. They like the lyrics and oh, and what I would do is I would make a demo of um, I would take Zach's demo and I would just sing my lyrics along with his uh, with his melodies. And and then I would uh, you know pass that demo along with the lyric sheet to to Phil and he would check it out and pass it to Richard and the guys, you know, and, and uh, he would be like caesar you know he'd give the thumbs up or the thumbs mm. down <laughs> and i would get and i would get the thumbs up you know so i was like all right go keep going keep the ball rolling mm. and <clears throat> i realized that there were still a few open slots for songs uh that i could write the music for as well so i st- i got to work on that and i i wrote the music for three songs uh propulsion one which is an instrumental uh, memories down the line yep. and the song the river sang and for those latter two i i also you know i wrote the lyrics as well and when i submitted the demos 
for that, they heard something in the Song the River Sang demo that they liked, and they said, we want you to sing lead mm. on that song, the yeah. album. It'll be our final song on the album. And so that was unexpected. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I've sung, sung lead before, but I never expected my voice to be something Kansas-y. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's yeah, but um, but they they wanted it, and it's consistent with their tradition. You know, you'd have if you listen to their earlier albums, their songs were Robbie Steinhardt, may he rest in peace. Uh, he sings the he sings the lead on a few, yeah. and and it's and it's an interesting foil to Steve Walsh's leads on the other songs. So this this kind of is you know nothing shocking for kansas to have a song or two on an album where there's a different voice um and i i just said I, okay i'm gonna go for it and um it's been it's been really well received so Absolutely. Yeah. uh now, now i gotta keep the vocals <laughs> chops up too that's right so so for you now you've got the second album pressure <laughs> Right, yeah, yeah, like that, that old thing, you know, you have your whole life to make your first album and like a year to make <laughs> your second right. one. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's that's why I, I said, look, you better get writing now because we'll be back on the road. And if you look back at all this, uh, the COVID shutdown and say, we're, we're, what did you do? Yeah, that's <laughs> <For> right. 17 months. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, no, that's a great outcome. And I mean, I know they're very different beasts, Tom, but I'm just interested in comparing and contrasting your work, jumping back 20 years again now to working with Yes um, and then Kansas. And just as an aside, you're the second episode in a row featuring a Yes um, keyboard player because we had Oliver Wakeman on last episode. Um, so both are similar in some ways, but different beasts in others, um, in being well-established and loved prog bands, um, were the different approaches required in entering and thriving, uh, in yes, as opposed to Kansas? There were a few elements that were different, uh, of course, uh, mainly the fact that when I came on to yes, it was a predetermined finite, uh, experience they said you right. we we need you for a year yeah and it's going to be with the orchestra and here's what we're going to be playing so it kind of quelled any aspirations of making demos for yes <laughs> and, and <laughs> saying hey you know i i would have loved to keep working with them but that wasn't in that no. wasn't their plan uh they knew that rick would be coming back yeah uh so I said, well, let's make the most of it. Now, learning the Yes music was a different animal because yeah. in the year, in the year, well, because here's the thing. Yes was the band that I had the posters up on the wall yeah. when I was a teenager and I knew their stuff inside and out. So I had an advantage going in of being able to like, I knew the forms of all the tunes. And that's like one of the most treacherous parts of Yes. If you're playing the Gates of Delirium, a ritual, like, it's it's not just the technicality of the parts it's where are you in the mm -hmm. song you know what's coming next cuz you could get lost and for for me i just had them imprinted on my consciousness from hearing them so much that i was i was solid in that regard so it was down to the business of getting the stuff really down now my high school prog band you know attempted roundabout and long distance run around and um, but this was now I had to do it for real and with, you know, with yes. So um, my process, they, they had me do an audition CD where they sent me a live, a live recording of two songs. Yes, your audition, Tom, is two songs, but it's close to the edge and the gates of delirium. Well, you know? So you're looking, you're looking at 40 minutes of two, you know, music <laughs> for your audition. <laughs> and um I had to caught, you know, get whatever gear I had at yeah. the time to make a multi key setup. And they said, all right, make us a recording, put our uh, live track on the left side and put your performance on the right channel so we can solo you out if we want to hear just what you're doing and um, and go for it. And I had, you know, I didn't have all the right gear, but I had some of the gear and I did whatever I could to, to get the, the sounds and, and the but mainly the parts. Right. And um, and I did it. And they 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 said, OK, now step two, come see us, hang out with us. We're recording the magnification album at, at a yeah. house in, in California. And um, so that was, you know, part two of the audition was the hang. 
Yeah. And and fortunately for me, you know, having devoured so many yes interviews over the years, I kind of had a feel for what the guys were like. And so I, I had developed a good rapport with them and they they found that refreshing. So because, you know, when look, touring is not just playing the music. No. You have to be no. you, you have to coexist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. And uh, especially if you're hired to do the That's job, right. you know, I people say, how do you, you know, how do you make it in touring and, and playing it? I was like, just my my one of my mottos is to solve more problems than I cause. Yeah, <laughs> that's a great <laughs> motto. You know, it's like that. I think that's, that's a good thing to aspire to. Um, and so I got I got on it and it was interesting because I had four bosses and they all wanted something that's slightly different you know john anderson chris squire alan white steve howe alan was pretty chill but john wanted me to play things a certain way uh chris wanted me to play things a certain way and he heard that i sang so he said i want you on backing vocals yeah. double me wherever you can um, which, yes, keyboardists hadn't been really called upon to do before as if the juggling act wasn't hard enough um, now I'm singing with the group yeah, as well. I was going to say, because yeah, you never accuse Rick Wakeman of being a backing vocalist. No, they, they <laughs> you know, and, and but man, like, what a joy that was to harmonize with John and yeah. Chris. I mean, come on, that was just, like, I got goosebumps when I was in that, when those harmonies locked in, and I was like, that's the sound yeah. that I loved yeah. for so many years. Um, so I relished it, but it, it definitely just added to the challenge. And... What's more, since we had the orchestra on stage, yeah. and you know, my my footprint on the rig was going to be a lot smaller. And they also, let's be honest, they didn't want to assert my personality as no. being a new member. Yes, because they knew that Chris, I mean, uh, that that Rick was going to be coming back the following year. That's right. So, it I wasn't going to be getting twelve keyboards on stage, no. like, like a yes keyboardist would. I had to do it in four. And there was no main stage yet. <laughs> no. yeah. And so I had this this old digital music MX8 MIDI uh, patcher device where, and I use this with Meatloaf as well. Um, that way, I, with a foot switch, I could just advance through programs and it would just spit out program changes to multiple units at once. And that way I could be changing up sounds uh, while I played another keyboard. And I would... In that rig, it was, again, it was the four keyboard rig. I had this Yamaha S80 for the piano and strings. Um, I had my Alesis Andromeda, which I had just gotten um, for all the analog Moog sounds and some other things. And they had a Yamaha AN1X, another, an early virtual analog polysynth. And then I was using the Korg CX3, the one that had just come out oh, yeah. at that point uh, for the organ. And we were throwing that through a motion sound um r3t i believe the model was called um and also we had a triton rack and that yeah. also that had the sampling option and the state-of-the-art zip drive oh, yes. uh, which were held the samples because we were doing owner of only heart with this old yeah. sample which had gone from a, a fair light to an yeah. emulator to a nut to an emacs to a <laughs> they had like right. through the years they kept they kept porting the samples to a future format and um so that was the rig there and i kept the the organ uh off the midi rig it was just audio and that way whenever i was playing organ was a was a time where i'd hit the program change switch and get my next batch of sounds and so i would it was choreography um and that's kind of like what i do with main stage now i have foot switched advancing presets but um so the there were a lot of t technical challenges which yeah. made it different in kansas but it was also like this is the job these are the tunes these are the parts that's right do them and and i also was in that linchpin role again, where I had to kind of be the interface between the orchestra and the band. Mm. It started off at the very beginning because uh, I could read music, so they wanted me to proofread some of the scores. Right, uh, and um, they said, you know, because the the scores weren't always jiving with, no. with the band, 
begin with. But Larry Groupe did an amazing job of orchestration for that tour. Um, but there were a few things that they, yes, wanted to tweak. And, and so I started developing this rapport with Larry and then eventually the other conductors um, of, the, of the orchestra throughout the tour. And I, a lot of my antics on stage were actually serving to give cues to, to the <laughs> conductor. Yeah, yeah. They're like, oh man, he's like jumping around. Who's the yes keyboardist? They stand there with their capes and they're very dignified, you That's know. Right. And it's like, I'm like, you know, like I can't contain my excitement for playing with yes. But there was also like, some of those jumps were to tell the the conductor this is where the downbeat That's is. That's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so. So, so that yeah. So, but with Kansas, it's it's a more inc- you know holistic all around thing i'm a part of it i'm in it they they give me a lot of trust yeah, so that's very in different. the group yeah and um i'm very happy being there so, so we've learned a couple of great tips from you already one is make sure you are listening to the band the other is solve more problems than you cause yes. when you're on tour which is fantastic <laughs> i'm wondering are there any other tips things you've learned philosophies that would be worth passing on based on your, you know, your depth of experience that, that would serve any keyboard player well? Yeah, well, if, if depending on the type of gig that one is looking for, um, I can't stress enough how important it is to learn things by ear and to develop your ear. Mm. Um, because in my career, I've very seldom been given the any sheets or charts or transcriptions yeah. or anything it's just like here's a recording you deal with it you figure it out that's your job you want to be on this level get it together and um there are exceptions of course you know when i play with renaissance i was doing orchestral parts so i was reading the original orchestral scores um but for kansas for yes for meatloaf uh, for Camel, Debbie Harry, and any of these tours that I've done, it was like the, what I was given was a recording. Yeah. So, um, and I will say, you know, going back to like you're saying, what were some of the big differences between the Yes experience and the Kansas experience? Now we have these slow downer apps and yeah. ways that we can, uh, even ways that we can kind of slice into an old stereo mix and try to get some tracks out of it. Um, whereas, before it was just a cd and pause and rewind and 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 it was harder and more painstaking to transcribe and things but i would say you know keep training the ear it's super important because um chances are you're going to need it if you're if you want to join in an established band that's touring yeah and um it's it's going to be on you to to figure it out but if you're also if you're looking for a touring gig with um something a little bit more in the jazz like you're looking to go with like michael buble and his orchestra or something like that then yeah you could be reading like make sure you're reading it's happening you know or like broadway shows things like that that's where like the you really uh stand out if you're a good sight reader um but yeah so i would say that and then keep uh Keep informed on sounds, you know, learn what were the instruments that were producing the the classic sounds that you hear. Mm. Um, some groups will be able to hire a programmer. Yeah. Uh, some will not like and with Kansas, I've done all my own yeah. programming. Um, and so it, it helps that I, I know the difference between the sound of, you know, a clavinet and yeah like um and what you know a selena that yeah, sound that has a phaser on it yeah. and and the one that doesn't like know your That's effects right. you know just keep uh learning about your gear and <clears throat> and uh yeah so th- those those two things I think really no, are they're great in. and they're great lessons. And I think you're right about the programmers. Um, so we do with a lot of guests and some are more players and some love the programming, but having that double ability of great chops and programming is probably one of the many reasons you, you've had a constant career in the area. It's yeah. It's, really... it's, it's definitely helped. And, and even like with yes, my, my tech Robbie Eagle, 
was a good programmer and he helped me get those sounds together but it always it, it sometimes it, it it really helped that i could like i could bring it on home like That's we right. would get like set we would get 75 to 80 percent there and i would be able to tweak the rest of the way so even when you have somebody um it, it helps to to get savvy with it and i'm look i'm still learning the, the ropes on some of these software synths yeah. um because it, it's pretty deep yeah, no, absolutely. And just speaking of working with artists and, and totally get your, you're in a, a great spot now. Are there artists in particular, though, um, that you have a burning desire to work with in the future? Well, I'm, I'm really focused on, on the next chapter in Kansas. Yeah, that's uh, right. Because like, what you said now, I mean, sadly, uh, Zach Rizvi left the group uh, during, during the lockdown. And so writing responsibilities have, have fallen to me in an even bigger yeah, way that's right um so i want to i want to deliver on that and um it's funny because people look at my resume and uh it's it honestly i'm not i don't have a bucket list where i'm like trying to pick off all no. my idols and <laughs> but right. but it's funny because it looks that way sometimes. <laughs> yeah, well you've done but, it but yeah. but yeah but i'm i'm not at large and and, no, and i'm, I'm right. really trying because Look, Kansas showed a lot of faith in me yeah. uh, to with their history and their longevity, and to to ha to to put their trust and say, "Hey, you know, here's the ball, run with it." That's right. Um, that's what I want to do. Now, when I write, I write without discrimination. I sort of just write and see what happens. Yeah. And so there are going to be songs that aren't really appropriate for Kansas. Mm, that's and, right. So I still have the ability to do my, you know, recording projects on the side. And um, when I do that, I'd love to to get um, some of my friends and, and musicians I admire, especially guys in the, in the funky side of things like yeah. my friend Bob, Bob Lanzetti is one of the guitarists and Snarky Puppy. Course, We've been yeah. looking uh, to work together. Uh, my friend Randy McStein, who's really tearing it up in the prog world now, great guitarist and songwriter and basis to um, we've worked together before. I'd like to work with him again. And, you know, so a lot of um, just musicians who who I, I admire and, and would love to collaborate with and, and probably in in the studio sense of things, I would say, is probably where it, where it would, yeah, it would be. Right. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And um... I'm going to get you to tag some keyboard players you'd love to hear interviewed in a minute. But before we get to that, um, Tom, uh, another standard question for us is your most memorable train wreck. So worst on stage disaster you've ever had that you're happy to share. Oh, man, that's like I blacked them out. <laughs> <laughs> you have to put me under hypnosis because <laughs> um, you just have to you know, like you can't let it eat, eat at you. Um, I Let's see. I mean. Wow. Uh, I'm sure that like once it's over, someone's going to tell me like, how could you not forget that time where, you know, <laughs> well, at least you haven't had next day and collapse. on fire and, and yeah. you know, I don't know. I, I think, um, Oh man, it, it, I think a lot, of, a lot of the gear stuff where you go for a yeah. sound and it's not there. In fact, I do have one. Um, a couple of years ago, I was filling in playing a couple gigs with Dennis DeYoung of sticks oh, yep. Yep. and he still plays a lot of keys live, but every once in a while he likes to step out and just be the front man. And that's why he's got second keyboardist. Mm. Uh, John Blasucci is his guy and does a great job. So I was filling in for John on a couple of shows. And Dennis, uh, rather defiantly, likes to play Mr. Roboto in his <laughs> uh, set uh, in, in the right in the middle. And that whole there's this whole synth intro yeah. that's that's on a sample and it was like we would play on motifs yeah uh live and they had like the sample memory but they'd have to load in this just long sample the intro to mr roboto is probably 30 to 30 to 60 yeah. seconds long and um we do it in sound check and dennis gives me the nod i hit one key and hold it down and here comes this intro and then uh, that's the whole thing so show comes and he gives me the nod. I press the key down and nothing comes out. Oh. And, he, and he's looking on me and he's like, start, please. And, and I'm I'm pointing at my other finger, which is down on the key going, I got nothing. And uh, 
so Dennis being the consummate pro that he is, you know, turns to the audience and, and makes a joke about, Oh, I shouldn't have bought that keyboard at radio <laughs> shack. Um, and, uh, so we move on to the next song and he, he looks at the tech saying, Hey, get, get it sorted. Um, so I, what we think what happened was that the power was cut between sound check and the show oh, wow. and the sample did not get reloaded yeah, lost, yeah. into memory. And, and it's funny because if I go back to my very first gig ever with a band, I was playing in like a techno band. We were like trying to do like a new order Depeche mode kind of thing. And I'm 15 years old and, and there's me and another keyboardist and he had this sampling keyboard, this Korg DSS one, which sounded awesome, yeah. but it took a minute. It took a minute <laughs> to load light. sound. And we're on, we're playing on this battle of the bands and, there's all these punk rock kids who are just like giving us the the evil eye because we got no guitars in the band yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and we had and we had we're doing this song where it starts off with some movie sample some dialogue sample or something and the poor my poor friend who's on the dss1 he's holding his his finger up the the, the universal sign for one minute please yeah. <laughs> And Ugh. he's holding his fingertip up, and, and we're waiting, and there, and the crowd's just getting more and more hostile, and and we finally, you know, got it. But it was the longest minute of my life. I can imagine. And, I, and from that point, I never purchased a sampling keyboard. Uh, like it was a rule for me that I had to have presets in ROM. That's you right. turn on the keyboard, it's there. Like it was, it was so scarring for me to 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 have like that empty keyboard yeah. unless in and for these floppy disks to load. And wouldn't you know it that so many years later that came to bite me again on stage with Dennis DeYoung in front of a few thousand people. Um, so I, I'm re I'm a real advocate for. Uh, flash memory yeah, absolutely <laughs> in flat. Uh, but uh yeah so you got a two for one there they That's both brilliant. had to do with samplers you know leaving me with my pants down so and it's funny how um, some the the greater um things change the less they also do because yeah that's my I, I have a chronos and i've never played it live much but my biggest dread is the chronos turning off and trying to reboot that thing between songs so it's the same thing. You got to wait two minutes. Yeah, yeah. You know, I I, I remember seeing that a lot of these workstations now they just they they take so long to load up. I'm like, come on, yes. it, you, you know. It's but it's it seems to be more studio centric now, and that's right. and that's what I love about main stage is that this, these MacBook Pros with SSDs, you know, they boot up in ten to twenty seconds. That's right. And, Oh, sure. Once the main stage loads up, it's still populating things in the background. But I'm a I'm a big big advocate of the fast start yes, of instruments. That's rightfully and, so. Um, yeah, the, you know things we deal with as keyboard players, right? Exactly. Yes, unique situation. Um, and then our last two questions, Tom. Um, tag a keyboard player. So it can be just one. It can be a few. If you know, you could listen to someone talk about their keyboard playing career. Um, who would it be? Alive or dead's even fine. I find we get a lot of dead people mentions. Oh, man. Well, I mean, one of my prog heroes is Carrie Muneer from Gentle Giant. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'd, I'd love to, you know, because, you know, he, again, stretched the limitations mm. of, of what he had. And, and Gentle Giant is, is kind of out there sort of serving their fans with, yeah. with unreleased material and stuff and if you get a hold of him I, i'd love to hear what he'd have to say about things um and as far as uh the current guys out there um i don't know if you've spoken to gil Asias yet no um but he he's doing great stuff uh glasses is as he goes by um and he's such a he's a great arranger yeah. And and just and and he's one of one of the guys I'm hearing that's got fresh new sounds. Like there's classic stuff he's really into the video game stuff uh and the 8 bit and the chip tune kind of influence yeah, sounds but he's also he's he's doing a lot of cool things with the I guess it's the Prophet XL or the that, that one of the newer Prophets that um or is it Prophet X that that he's combining samples and synthesis in a really interesting and fresh way. And and when I hear him, I'm like, oh, that, there's a new sound <laughs> that that a keyboard player is doing, and it's not just a sound designer and a soundtrack kind of thing. You know, it seems to be the new sounds have been the domain of the the composer. 
Yeah, um, that's right. And I want I want to hear somebody playing and improvising and composing like in real time with new synth sounds. And uh, he's one of the guys, so I'd love to oh, hear what he has to that. say. And you'll be pleased to know, I think you're our first guest where you are actually you have been mentioned in a previous episode by guest as someone they would love to hear interviewed. Oh wow! So who do I pay? So so I, I, I assume <laughs> I I assume you're aware of Michael Whalen, but if not, um, of course, yeah. yeah so cool. Michael Whalen called Thanks, you out man. as someone he'd love to hear um, interviewed. Well, that's awesome. Thank you, Michael. Yeah. So there you go. Um, and the last hard question, and for our guests, um, they'll know sometimes we give people a heads up, and I apologise, I didn't give you a heads up, Tom. Five albums that, yeah, five favourite albums of all time, Desert Island Discs album you couldn't live without. Top five. Oh, wow. Okay. In no order, we'll shuffle them up. Great. Um, but I'm going to say Prince Purple Rain. Oh, nice. Yeah, that's, that's a So we really must be a similar record. age. That was the first album I ever bought. Yeah. Yeah, I I've, I love Prince, and it's funny. Just a quick side. I I remember I was going to yeah, I was about I don't know nine years old I think when that came out, yeah. and the uh, there was a there was a record store up the road uh, that used to sell forty five RPM singles, yeah. and they would they would sell them by chart. They would be in these little cubby holes that were numbered by their chart position. Oh yeah. So you would go and you say, oh, this song is number sixteen this week, and you would just tell the the clerk behind the desk, you know, give me one of those number 16s, please. <laughs> cool. You were like a kid at the bar, right? And so I remember buying the Let's Go Crazy oh, 45 yeah. RPM single. Now, the B side <laughs> of Let's Go Crazy is Erotic City. Oh, yes. which, you know, and, th- and this predates the parental warnings yes, on the album. That's right. And I would, I started. <laughs> blasting that tune on my little record player my sister comes running and she's like turn it down <laughs> that's, right. that's gold i was about to get in a heap of trouble for for that <laughs> um not having any idea of what was to come lyrically in that song that's right. um, but that that that's still i still have that single what a, what a great thing um so okay so prince purple rain um this is going to be an oddball choice and and i know that no one else has said this yet but the Ventures Christmas album. Okay. Ventures, uh, the Ventures are iconic. Great, yeah. Yeah, great 60s surf mm. band. And they, what they did was they did, they were kind of like innovators in the mashup. Uh, and so they would do all these Christmas songs, but they were in the style of hit rock and roll songs of the That's day. Cool. So you'd think you'd be hearing I Feel Fine, but it would be going into a Christmas song or well. Wooly Bully or Tequila or their own Walk Don't Run. You'd think you'd be hearing Walk, Don't Run, but then it would go into Sleigh Ride or something like that. And to me, it always, you know, it was always the special album for the holidays. And it it, it's also reminds me of the joys of vinyl. You know, that's like, uh, you know, just putting on the record was it was a big thing. So that is an album that's got great emotional and, uh, you know, just uh, value for me. Um, Another one going back early is Men at Work, Business as Usual. Uh Look, you're a charmer, Tom. Aussie band. I know, and I'm not just saying that because I'm talking to people in Australia. <laughs> yeah, but right? it's a great you album. Know? Yeah, but yeah, and and Colin Hay's still probably my favorite singer. Oh, I go amazing. to him whenever I can, yeah. and you know, go. I, I wouldn't mind working with him one day on on a song or two. Yeah. You know, I would actually, I would love it um, because I just that tenor voice yeah, was always amazing. an influence on me. You know, Sting, Colin Hay. Um, John Anderson, like that, that sonorous tenor. Yeah. Uh, it was a voice that I always loved hearing. Um, and the sounds are so fat on the album and the it's, songs are yeah. just tight, you know, it's just tight rock and roll, you know, easy, easy to, to digest and, and stuff. Um, for, I got to go with yes, fragile. Yep. Right. Um, because, and a lot of my, you know, my yes, friends are always asking me what my favorite yes album is and they're like oh but come on close to the edge you know relay or whatever and i was like of course it's like i i would love any of them but for me fragile was the album that got me into yes that's right and it also and it also contains my favorite yes song which is heart of the sunrise uh sadly one i did not get to play with the band oh really yeah okay Uh, but that that song just gives me chills to this day um so uh, we're up to four. <laughs> yeah, one to go. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, number five, it always varies. I, maybe I, I go with some 
it, it, does do best of count or am I yeah, cheating? Yeah, they do. You, know? no, like, you would you would be um, wouldn't believe how many people have chosen the Beatles box set as one of their choices. Oh yeah, what a great loophole, right? Yeah. Uh, that that would be awesome. Yeah, it, well, I would say, man, I, I gotta I gotta flip a coin either with um, something from ELP maybe. Oh yeah, just because just Keith was such an important absolutely. Uh, part of of me and and my love for keyboards and and that or or maybe the beatles magical mystery tour which is an odd choice but it it has strawberry fields forever which is probably my one of my favorite songs of all time by anyone yeah um uh so yeah i don't know it that's such a tough choice (laughs) no i think you can get both of them tom that's great 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 picks um just as a total left of centre question, you went back to Meatloaf and Kazim Sultan. Um, I, I, one of my biggest devastations over the last 15 years is that Todd and Kazim and the new cars didn't have a huge impact on the world. I thought they started extremely strong and sadly didn't go a long way. I saw that band. Yeah. Oh, um, you did? Live. Great. Yeah, I, I, I did get to see the new cars. They were touring with Blondie, and this was actually probably about a year before I played with Debbie Deb Harry. Harry. Yeah, okay. Which is funny because I saw Kansas and Yes on tour together okay. on the Master, uh, on not knowing, <laughs> never having any fathom that one day I would no. play with both of the groups, right? Um, but yeah, the new cars were interesting because I love the cars. Yeah. Um, and so it was cool to see Greg Hawks out there doing his thing with Synth. And I ended up, Greg Hawks sat in with Spiraling years later. Oh, cool. we, we were, yeah, we were on the, um, the Cars uh, tribute album uh, ah, that yep. came out. And, and, and uh, so we played the CD release party for the Cars tribute album in, in Boston, their hometown. And yeah. Greg Hawks came. And the funniest thing, I was like, oh, man, I, I wish he had his... A Univox Mini Korg <laughs> on hand, so he could sit in with us. And I swear, as soon as I say that, he just pulls out the Univox wow. Mini Korg that that just what and we played just what I needed, and he just had it set up and, and had the sound. I was like, okay, there, there's a yeah, achievement there's a unlocked. There. Yeah, so cool. Um, and I also like Prairie Prince from yeah. his work with with XTC. And things like that but it was interesting because it didn't sound so much like the cars to me it just sounded like another cool band that's right Um, yeah so who knows what would have happened if they if it was uh, just another entity but maybe there were too many expectations for it to be the cars because it didn't have that there was a, like when I think of the cars, like R- Rick Ocasek said in an interview that he he loved to to write about the night and the mystery yeah. of the night. It was a car song. Every song has something about the night That's in right. it. And and this was a different vibe. Yeah, it was. Yeah. This, yeah, and um, so a cool vibe, but but it, it, it didn't have the, yeah. it didn't have sunglasses on. No, that's right. That's a nice. Do you know one. what I mean? Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love it. That's a great. That's a great analogy. And it's safe to say, Tom Greg Hawks is obviously on my personal bucket list to to get to interview him. But he's a difficult man to contact. But yeah, um, yeah, great. He's an absolute idol. Um, sir, thank you so much. You've given us more time than we deserve, and we really appreciate it. It's it's absolutely brilliant talking to you. And um, I hope the next twelve months does end up in lots of touring and and things getting somewhat back to normal. So I'm excited for you alone on that front oh my pleasure thank you for having me and i uh, hope to do it again sometime and there we have it i did say paul in the intro that tom was a genius of a guy i think it was that i said and you know just an absolute pleasure it's it's broken record i say it every time but in particular tom was an absolute pleasure yeah, he was such fun to talk to, and uh, what a nice guy. I, I really enjoyed listening to his his insights and his philosophies around keyboard playing. Yeah, no, absolute treasure. So thank you again, Tom. Um, so, yeah, and thank you again for listening to us, folks. Um, we, we've been really, um, I don't know what the word, we're very grateful, but, you know, really gobsmacked by the growth in the podcast and, and the number of listeners that do touch base with us, and we love hearing from you. Um, which is why um, I'll do our usual thing of saying our website is www.keyboardchronicles.com. Uh, we're on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash keyboard chronicles. 
and on Twitter at the keyboard chr1 also um, want to do a quick shout out to our patreon supporters so we've got a, a number of them but special shout out to our um, key sponsors uh, Greg um, from over to you Paul the oh yes the Korg Chrome user group on Facebook exactly yeah hugely appreciate um, their support of the podcast and to all our wider um, range of patrons you, you really do uh, make a difference and allow us to do what we do so we, you greatly appreciate it and, and if for the price of a coffee a month you want to help us go from strength to strength then that website address is patreon.com forward slash keyboard chronicles and then more broadly our email address is editor at keyboard chronicles.com paul thank you sir i know you won't be with us for next episode but we'll see you back the one after that and um at this time it's for a much more fun reason and that's your you're off um doing some more music work. So have fun and we'll see you for episode 39. Thank you, David. It's been an absolute pleasure and I cannot wait to reconnect with you and our next guest. Absolutely. And um, th- most importantly, thanks to all of you out there for listening and we'll hopefully see you back here next episode. <laughs>